preamp die that I bought. One of these, which is just a small phono preamp, also about 50 quid. Uh, very nice quality in the art stuff. What I discovered after they make one box which has combined this and this, which I would have bought at the time, <laughs> but uh, that's history. The other bit of kit I have that's useful, which came from uh, a conversation with a former Bruner, Emma Bruner, he wanted one of them, I didn't know about such things. This is just a three way uh, passive switch. So it has three inputs and, and one output. And three buttons. So at home it has date, tape deck, record deck, FN tuner plugged in so I can just switch between the three, three of them without having to do all the plugging and unplugging on the back of the, uh, uh, of the, of the, of the USB sound card. Okay, so that's the hardware done. I'm running actually through a, a, a tape deck here. So if, I, if I was running with a, a record deck I didn't want to really bring, bring the, the, the deck and the fragile arm out, but I would be plugging this. So I don't need this with a tape deck, because the tape deck's delivering a line level signal. Um, Audacity settings, I run it on the standard uh, default, 44100 hertz, 32-bit uh, float. Uh, I keep it 32-bit float, because I know I'm wanted to kind of do some manipulation of the signal and amplification. I'm advised that's the best way to do it. When it gets exported at the end of this, we'll see it going to 16-bit. I also on uh, I've got software playthrough enabled on here because I want to be able to listen and monitor uh, while I'm recording. Not too, if it was an LP, not too loud because it would actually feed back to the the, the, the stylus. Headphones are quite good for doing that, but you wouldn't hear anything if I did that. Um, in terms of inputs here, I've selected my uh, UA1EX device um, there, so the sound's going to come from there and the sound's going to go back out to the, uh, the, the speakers through, through my sound card. I happen to be using Windows Direct Sound. I can't remember why I chose that. I had a long discussion with Gail at one time, so I chose that. Um, it seems we've got the of the others as well, I don't know. <laughs> um, so the first thing to do then is to um, With LPs, basically, I think the first thing you need to do is to uh, make sure they're nice and clean before you start, because um, uh, otherwise you get even more. You will have bits and pops. You will have over the year, unless you've been very, very careful with them. And um, just just washing them is, is good. Flattening a warped LP is good because otherwise you'll get uh, travel up and down, which distorts it. With tapes, the the, the advice normally is to it's been you know, stored for a long time, rewind from end to end because the tape gets stretched and compressed and against each other, and it. It, it just re uh, records better, apparently. Avoid, by the way, when you uh, as I say, you have the kit service. That's I, I service my uh, uh, my uh, record deck myself, and I got around to cleaning the stylus, and I used some isopropyl alcohol, and it detached the diamond from the cantilever. <laughs> 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 I found a company that would be tip it, but they said honestly, it's cheaper to buy a new cartridge. So. So don't use like also isopropyl alcohol. <laughs> the first thing to do uh, uh, when we're here, the um, one of the things that's, oh, that's hard to find in Audacity is, is the mon monitoring is not always on, like it is with a lot of You have to turn monitoring on, so I can turn monitoring on here with. Uh, I need to see. Let me no. just play the tape there, because I want to get the signal level. So what I've got here in the middle is uh, essentially some uh, silence between two. If I pick, so if I select that and uh, amplify that, we 
we see that it actually isn't really silence. So here it isn't really silence. But if I just undo that, and I, I, I can now use that as a, as a sound type. I'm assuming that's going to be fairly constant in the track gaps on, on this tape. It's a reasonable assumption. So uh, if I use effect uh, noise removal and get the noise profile. Audacity now will remember that noise profile until I change that noise profile. No, noise profile. So, so we're working on this table, this LP, that would have been fine. Just rewind the, uh, the tape. I can delete this now, but I don't need this because it's remembered the, uh, the, the noise profile. I should have explained, although it was bang on the, uh, uh, the minus six decibel, I've got two ways of controlling that signal here. I can actually control it through the, uh, the slider here. But one of the good things about the uh, Edrol device is it has a, a hardware gain control as well. Some people find with the UCA202 it seems to deliver a slightly too hot signal, doesn't it? And they can't control it. There's, there's no lane pull control on the yeah. UCA202. Ah. Okay. Well, that's good. So there we are. So let's start doing the, uh, the, ca the capture here. And we're not going to do it. <laughs> there are a number of noise processing, ste processing steps that the, um, the, work the workflow talks about. The, the first is uh, removing uh, DC offset. I don't believe that um, this sound, that sound card has been DC offset. If I actually zoom in, uh, it doesn't. DC offset where we, where we, is when you get the DC signal, the DC applied to the signal. You'll see that the, the signal's slightly off, up or down, above the line there. Certainly when I'm recording from uh, internet streams on this device, this mo lo a lot of modern Windows PCs have got built-in uh, DC offset in hardware or software inside the kit. But if you, don't, if you do have DC offset, it, it's best to correct that before you do any other uh, processing on the signal. And you can do that with the, uh, I do it now. Uh, if I select the whole uh, track there and I go to the normalize effect, the normalize effect has got, uh, an ability to <laughs> either normalize the, uh, the, 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 remove the DC offset and do normalizing either uh, the, on the whole uh, uh, track or, in, or each track independent. You might want to do each track independently if you've got an unbalanced cartridge or unbalanced hi fi system, it will just balance the two channels up nicely for you. And this lets you decide what level you're going to normalize to. I actually choose normally to. Uh, normalize to minus three decibels. In theory, you can go to zero dB, but there are apparently some devices that don't like, uh, don't play nice at that level. When Dominic was only first wrote uh, uh, this uh, normalize effect, I think you could only run it at minus three dB, couldn't you, in the early versions of Audacity? The thing is hard to remember now, yeah. So I kind of thought, if Dominic chose minus three, minus three is good enough for me. <laughs> And it, and, it, and, it, and it seems to work well. So basically doing that, we now just, with those unchecked, it's not gonna do the normalization. I don't wanna mess with the, with the amplitude of the signal at this stage. All I wanna do is take my DC offset away. It's done, that's quick. Um, there's another step in there for removing subsonic rumble. Won't apply to the, uh, the, 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 the tape deck here. Um, tends to apply when you have record decks where you can get rumble. I never bothered with it because my the app that I run it through is a, a, an old quad 33303 which discards subsonic stuff to protect the electrostatic loudspeakers anyway. But I did some tests and you're on, on the uh, on my record deck you know, with the, uh, the spectrum analysis, spectrum analysis, and it doesn't seem to me that I can see any uh, low level rumble. I know Bill Worry does take it up if I got the advice to do this. Um, having captured the, yeah. the whole. I wanted to ask about the minus three. Yeah. Uh, as I understand it, six decibels is the minimum difference 
that humans can detect. So right there's a reason. No. So one, the only, I mean, uh, uh, one reason is that if you, um, you know, if you max out signal of some some devices, well, that's uh, then you're sort of pushing all the devices to the limit in, in principle, you know, depending on how everything is calibrated. So uh, that might be high. Another another reason possibly for doing it is just because you have a, a sample value of plus one does not mean signal represented by that sample has a max of twenty one because when you, you know, when you when you convert from digital to analog you're doing some kind of interpolation right and and so you could actually get overshoot well beyond that sample mm. uh, so so a sample value of point one you know if you have a signal at zero that suddenly goes to point one and back to z well and stays there goes back to zero the analog signal represented by that goes well beyond right. one. So that might be another reason. Okay. I think another reason is if you if you want to mix um, two signals together, if you've got them both at you know, zero FS, um, then you can get clipping yeah. you know, very quickly. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So or it, or yeah. if you apply you know almost any effect to, 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 to something consistent. that's really maxed out, effects could cause you to go beyond that. Yeah. Well, I think I yeah. But, but, but the three dB headroom that it's got there, it's like in terms of the sound quality, it's going to be neither here nor there. So it, right. it's small enough to be insignificant. Right. I mean, it's large enough to be safe. If, if, if it's at minus three, then instead of sixteen bit audio, you have fifteen and a half bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I've got to point out, though, but I hinted at it before. When I was recording, I was recording here with this minus six decibel. This actually corresponds to about because these, these uh, by default uh, dis display linear and these display uh, logarithmic. So really, we are aiming at a to sit within this 50% band. And the mistake that a lot of people make is to think, oh, it's like an old-fashioned tape recorder, and I need to max the signal and get these blues touching the edge if I can. It. I, I made that mistake to start with. And if anyone did a careful reading and talking to people like Steve and Collins and Gail that. Uh, so, uh, maybe realize the error of my ways, but a lot of people, if you look at um, tutorials on the web for Audacity, most of them have got waveforms that pack this out. I mean, it really isn't necessary. That's a perfectly good, good level signal to work with. Um, what I want to do now is to remove, remember we had that tape, we, we stored our, no, our noise profile of the tape this. So all I can do now is I select the whole uh, project again and click <coughs> and repeat. I want to repeat. I want to do the noise removal. It knows my noise profile from, from last time. I've got slightly less aggressive um, settings than the, uh, than the defaults. Steve, you advised me on, on those. You've changed your advice slightly, haven't you? The last uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it works for me. I, use, I, use, I don't use this with LPs. I do use it if I'm recording tape. Uh, and I particularly use it if I'm recording from web streams it, and, and from FM stereo because the, the web stream and the FM stereo both carry noise and you can take those hiss noises out very nice, not very nicely by just, so we stored our noise pro, profile, we're now just going to, I'm just going to set my defaults there and apply it quickly, so that should be that for the noise <coughs> gone, let's listen to it again now. I suspect you can't hear much difference. <laughs> but we know that noise is come on. <laughs> the, um, I may be slightly controversial. Because the, 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 it's tape here, there aren't, there, there aren't pits and pops that you would get with them. Why don't you use it on LPs? Don't they have a, a rumble generally? Uh, yeah, you take that up with a rumble filter. Yeah, I, okay. I've never. I, I experimented and it seemed to take out more than I wanted to take out. The trouble with any noise removal, you're taking out signal as well, and you know, it's always a compromise. So, yeah, that's why I don't do it for me. The, with LPs, you never you know, over the years, you're going to get clicks and pops. And um, when I first started with Audacity, there, were no, there was no uh, you know, click removal. I think the click removal tool was not in it at that stage. And I used to, to uh, remember when we looked at the spectrograms with the uh, 
with a, with a bright pink line. I used to look for those, listen for those, look for those, and then repair them by manually drawing with the draw tool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, and, and then uh, they brought in the, um, the developers kind of brought in the repair effect, which enabled you to select up to 128 samples from within the waveform, which is why, by the way, I have non-default settings here. I have it so, so I can always count that I've got 128 samples, uh, so uh, maximum selected uh, there. Um, I have to be honest here. I think that the uh, the well, we all know I think that the um, the audacity clip removal is not the best in class in the world. It, it actually fails to detect uh, clip. This is a problem. It repairs okay. It doesn't detect enough. So when I'm using it, I actually use a um, um, a, a third party piece of software which you have to pay for. It's about twenty twenty five dollars or something like that. Called Clip Repair. It's an Australian mathematician, but this very focused piece of software. So what I do is I export um, the, uh, do, do make the make the, the, the raw capture, ex well, do these other processes, export a 32-bit WAV file, process this through Clip Repair, and then re-import it back into Audacity. It's a magical, magical piece of software. And I'm just hoping that one day uh, people do talk about improving uh, this uh, stuff. I know you, I know you, that's why I'm, that's why I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to be up with that level. The sad thing for me is I, 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 the, the last LP I did uh, uh, manually and with the repair tool was a, uh, an album that was un totally unavailable on, uh, on CD. It was my wife's, one of my wife's favourite albums. So for a birthday present, I spent about a week manually getting the clicks off. After that, I had a conversation with Greg Kozakowski on, uh, on the forum. And he pointed me in the direction of this piece of the software, I thought. And he, he let you try it. The thing that Greg gave to you, you know, a 14 day free trial. I, I tried it on this LP that I'd just done. Um, it found a lot more clicks than I hadn't found. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he did the processing in about five minutes. <laughs> That's the only non audacity software I use in this whole process. I want to uh, swap projects here to, so I've got something uh, a bit more realistic to look at for the next stages here. I want to talk about labeling tracks in this next one. Pretty please. <laughs> Open this, but I might as well have a copy break. This is alpha 2.0.6, I'm <laughs> being brave here. No, oh, it's there. Um, actually, I know, I'm going to open in the back one. <laughs> I'll try to open the same thing again. This happens to be, um, I've skipped some of, the, some of the steps here because I wanted to talk about the uh, the, 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 the labeling and dealing with the, uh, the, the intertracks. Um, this happens to be a, uh, a section out of um, uh, a Dublin City FM radio program that I record every Monday nights. It's on too, too late for me to listen to. And every now and again, he plays nice tracks. So uh, I borrow them for a while to decide whether I like the artist and the song enough. If I do, I'll go and buy the, the, the CD. If I don't, I think, no, I don't want that. I don't need that anymore. So, but this is quite a useful tool for doing that. It will be the same process uh, with, with, with your LP tracks. Lab labeling can be, uh, is, um, I tend to, uh, when I'm doing the recording, I place the labels roughly in the right position to start with. As, as the uh, cursor's going past, you can uh, either place the cursor there and type a control B, or you can, uh, well, do that now, um, control, uh, control B, or as it's, uh, mute it. I haven't got your nice open uh, leader, it's not here. Uh, then it's just given a nice new delete feature overnight. Um, and as it's playing, or recording and recording, you can place labels with a control label to a mark. I mean, those will be marked in the, um, in the inter track gap. So you see, I've, I've done that already here because I wanted to shorten this process a, a little bit because we will be here quite, quite a long time. So I have these, these three tracks here. I've marked roughly uh, where they end. Uh, they're, they're labeled. You can actually do, not, not just create a label, but type the text. Oh, no, here we go. 
I said, you want to hear? I think you should use your nice label for this. Well, <laughs> it's not on this one. But you can actually, you can type the text in while you're while you're uh, while you're doing. You have to be quite careful uh, when you're typing the text, and it is easy sometimes to um, get focused on the wrong place and um, stop your recording. So <laughs> it's, I think it's a bit of an advanced feature too, and it does write that in the uh, in the tutorial. It's an advanced feature to uh, do the label, but. We can see from here, from looking at this, and there's only three tracks here, but how many you get on an LP? What, seven on one side, and I prefer to work one side. But normally, it's pretty easy to see. Not so easy here, because I've got talk on here. But here, you can quite clearly see an inter-track gap. So it's, not, it's, <coughs> when it's quite easy to think, oh yes, I do want to put my label just there. Um, what I do with these, particularly if I'm sort of Borrowing off the radio, like this is indeed with tapes and LPs. The fades may not be what I what I want, and I may, may need to adjust those. So if we go to the, the front end of this fellow here, oh, you see it's fairly fairly abrupt. Mm. Let's hear him. Oh, sorry. Stop. Play. Would be better. Slightly abrupt start. Now what I'm going to do is just fade in this first chunk. Using your three. If I, if I just do one, uh, I've got a piece, uh, keyboard shortcuts so fade in and fade out, so it gives them so much. So my old left button is my fade in. That gives me my um, a straight linear fade. But um, following the advice I had from Steve some years ago, I now apply three, which gives me a nice sort of shaped face fade to the lead in. Sometimes it's detectable, sometimes it isn't, but I think you're right, it does actually mostly sound nice and we can just listen to that fade. Yeah, I think it's better than it was before. I'm sitting in a railway station, got a ticket for my... I might recommend a song, but not the same time. Um, stop, not pause. See what I mean, Nathan? <laughs> uh, we now go to the... Um, Next label, you can tab to the next label here. I've got, uh, I've already marked where I think the song, that particular, where that particular song ends. The next one starts. We we'll just check that. Play in. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah, I've been quite careful. I think we know that end mark is reasonably accurate. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. By the way, that these, you see the yellow lines there, it gets sticky and I'm dragging. That's quite a useful feature. I can't hold this and uh, be over there at the same time. But you see the yellow lines? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that means it's actually accurately on that. And once I release the cursor, it goes, but now that's accurate. So I can now silence that. The next thing I want to do is to pick this. The actual zoom down. Steve wrote a very nice um, fade. We discussed it yesterday. Studio fade, studio fade, fade out. And he, he talked about the, the, the characteristic, and that's what I'm going to apply here. And so a bit of effect. Studio fade out, and that will give us a. That will also give us a nice uh, shaped fade rather than a linear fade. It, that's funny stuff with the frequency levels, doesn't it? it, it it sustains the high frequencies for longer. Yeah, yeah it's just got it's got a little bit more yeah. towards the so end. Just, just, yeah. just to test that. I mean, the advantage is we can always un if we want to fade longer, we can do that. We just undo and fade. So we can we can play with this, but I suspect this from experience, I'm guessing this is going to be uh, pretty pretty close to what I want to get. Seconds is normally a pretty good guideline, isn't it, for some things? I, I know, yeah. But, you know, let's, uh, let's try fading over that instead. And see. It's, um, uh, 
So you notice one thing that I did do is before I, I did silence the inter-track gap. Um, I happen to like proper silent gaps between uh, the LB tracks and the tape tracks and the other ones that I make. They're something for the rumbly noise that the uh, horns don't have in there. They, they don't want to take it out. I, I don't quite understand that. But you asked about the rumble horn, and yeah, between the gaps, I like to get rid of it, but I get it rid of it with absolute silence. Um, just did it that way. Um, but basically, I'll do the same process for the other two tracks there. So those are, those are notes for myself when I'm doing this project for the weekend. You can see on Wednesday. Um, the, uh, the labels, by the way, can be uh, moved up and down to, uh, to get their accurate positions. I normally go for... Uh, Two second gap between the things. Yeah, two second gap with about one and a half from the end of the fade to, to, to uh, one thing. But the, the labels, you can pick up the uh, the center, the white bit there, moving up and down. If you're not careful, you can turn them into um, range labels, and it becomes, life becomes a bit more interesting that way. Um, so I prefer, I prefer to work with the, with the point labels. The last thing I do before. Um, Exporting uh, these is to make sure that I get the, the level right for that minus three, de uh, minus three decibels. Um, we have two effects in Audacity for that: uh, normalize and um, and uh, amplify. I tend to use amplify for the for the um, amplitude, amplitude adjustment precisely because if you remember when I had my uh, my normalize set up. It's, it's set up basically to be a DC offset removal tool. So I find it quite handy myself to keep it part uh, of that way. But we don't need to do that because we've already removed our DC offset. Um, but the one thing we do want to do is to get the amplitude right, so I will use the effect um, amplify. Now this lets me. Uh, Choose the level. The default will take will be to take it to uh, an amplitude of uh, of three point uh, of zero point zero. Uh, you can see this signal's a bit uh, a bit hotter than that. So if I just put minus three in there, sorry, minus three in there, minus three in there. It basically doing math on every single sample there, you know, so it's doing quite a fair amount of work for that, you know. But you know well, it's probably spending all this time just copying from <laughs> allocating disk space <laughs> copying files. <laughs> we can see now it just sort of uh, re reduced the, the amplitude of that that, that, that that signal there. Um, there's a final optional step, we talked about it yesterday. Um, uh, compression. Uh, compression is used to make things sound louder. We talk, you talked about it being a perception. And it is a perception thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, there is a compressor in Audacity. It works well for some things. There's another uh, compressor that's recommended for use with Audacity. It was developed by a guy called Chris Cable. We talked about that briefly yesterday. And he developed that for because um, he listened to opera in his car. Personally, I prefer not to use compression. Um, the difference, if you, listen, if you listen to Radio 3 in this country, which doesn't basically use compression, and you switch over straight away to um, classic FM, which sounds compressed and noisy in comparison, take me back to Radio 3, please. And I kind of like to listen to my records uncompressed. Uh, but that is an optional step that's in, in the workflow there. 
So the final step, or sorry, what I would do with these as well, normally, as well as labeling my uh, ten, although what has to your auto number, I tend to label number them myself. Um, the reason I do this uh, is because is because um, I want to work on one, with one side of a, an LP or one side of a tape at a time. In this particular tape here had four sides. Uh, it's theoretically quite possible to record the whole thing into Audacity and deal with it. I just find it easier to work with a smaller working set. So then when I'm working with side two of the, of the album, of course, I don't want to start at uh, a different label. I just find it easier to manage my label numbering manually about that. In terms of export, one thing we need to consider with what we're going to be doing, we're going to be exporting, because we've been working in 32-bit, 44.1 uh, kilohertz. We're going to export to uh, standard WAV PCM stereo, 44.1 uh, again, but at 16-bit. Uh, so Audacity is going to do the downsampling for us. Um, if we just downsample directly, uh, we would get uh, sort of artifacting noises. Is that the best way to describe them? It's you know, people, people complain about it because right. they don't understand how to use it. So there's a, a, a tool called Dither, which you can control from your uh, preferences. Under the quality tab, you get the, um, this is for real-time conversion when, when uh, Audacity's working, I've got Dither, no Dither set on, on there. This is my basic uh, sampling. Uh, default, working defaults. This is when I'm actually doing the high quality conversion, going from 32 bit to 16 bit. So I'm using best quality, it will be the slowest. I want, I want, I'm, you know, I'm on a serious job with this. Oh, you recommend shapes rather than triangle, don't yeah, you? Yeah, well, that's, that's yeah. changed actually. Yeah, it's, it has um, changed. I'm going to change uh, that here now. Yeah, at one point so there was a problem with shape dither in that on stereo tracks, um, the amount of dither was quite a lot more than it should have been. Yeah, but that's been fixed. So at that time, my recommendation was to use triangle, yeah, because it produced less audible noise than, 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 than shape of the, but now it has been fixed, so shape of the is... Just is my new default. Yeah. <laughs> so I've, I've told all that, audacity when I remember that, because it's in my preference setting, that will stay that way until I come around to change it again. Because it shape it is the default in that as well. Is so, it? Yeah. Oh. So, to, in order to create usable WAV files from devices like this or uh, Windows Media Player or whatever, all we need to do now is to um, uh, uh, export multiple. Ex export multiple gives me the choice to um, split my files based on these labels. So, where I, wherever I've got these point labels, um, Audacity is going to create, which is going to create a dummy one at the end as well. I haven't seen that. Um, you can choose to include audio before the first label. I didn't have any audio there, but I, I, I always make sure I don't. I, I don't know why you want to include anything before the first label, but you can do that if you want to. You can split the label based on tracks. So you might have um, a project which has got several tracks where you've got each, I think, because you've been working by one and muting at a time and you can export on those. And I'm basically, for the, when the file gets exported, it goes to uh, the label um, uh, track name. <coughs> this is the numbering that I don't use, numbering before or, or, post, or post numbering. So basically pressing the uh, export button now. I've just exported three. Uh, wow, I don't know where I put this actually. Let me just check. Uh, uh, you wouldn't believe the number of people who did that on the forum. They like to say, I can't find my audio. <laughs> and that's because they just did what I did there. Um, export location. It's gone to. Oh no, no, that was gone exactly, exactly where I wanted to go. No, okay, so well. I kind of wanted to show this because if you remember yesterday when, when, when we were talking on the, uh, for everybody except 
um, we were talking in the tips and tricks, I was talking about getting a, a taxonomy right so you can find your stuff. There's a good example here where I've got a, a folder, a working folder called radio, it's num numbered one because I use it a lot to it at the top of my display. The DJ, whose, whose program it was, uh, and within that the file of the program itself and a WAV file to collect the WAV so I can find these and store them, uh, store them easily. Um, the next, the most important step comes after this, which is to make the backup. Um, I, always, I always think it's the most, most important step in the whole process. We haven't done a lot of work here today because we've, we've just been playing. But if you've done 100, 200 LPs or more LPs, you really don't want to be losing those map files. It's fine to say, they, oh, I put them all in, I've turned them into MP3s on my, uh, on my little iPod. They're fine, they're safe. They're not safe like that. You've done a lot of work, you've done all the labeling, all the signal processing, and um, you do want to keep them. And in my case, I gave L LPs to the, uh, to the charity shop when we moved out. I wish I hadn't actually. And they were making me something I should have. No, they didn't have the, the classical ones. But, uh, that's another, another story. Uh, but it, I, I back up to uh, two separate one terabyte disks. They're cheap enough these days. If I was being really, really cautious, I would have a third, at least a third disk and an off-site disk probably at my wife's office and circulate them on the weekly. I can't, I can't be bothered to do that. I think I'm safe, just about safe enough with those two, unless the house burns down then I'll be in trouble anyway. So, uh, in terms of usage, I think what we produce there are, um, if we go to uh, 14, uh, Casey, See what I mean about taxonomy? That's in front of it. That be the, the three we just uh, created. And if I just click on that, Windows Media Player will eventually. Uh, we cheated it because we have gone from this tape, but in fear we've gone from this tape to a player who's a media file that can be used and shared with the people of the world. Even because his sister in Schenectady, we've probably managed to that, that one. And um, in terms of my issue, you notice I did export WAV there. Most people will be willing, be willing to export to WAV, uh, MP3s or, a or, or AAC. Personally, because I'm, I'm, I'm using an iPod, um, I export as WAV, but I use iTunes uh, to convert to, um, uh, to AAC. It's slightly quicker and it manages the metadata for me in a slightly more, ever so slightly more slick way. I also prefer to use export the WAVs because I exported WAVs against the day when I bought a, a device that I bought probably about last November. Came onto the market a, uh, a Korean device called the uh, the Cocktail X30, which is a bit gives it's a bit like a um, a mains powered iPod, uh, big internal disk. I've got a two terabyte. Uh, you can go up to four terabyte currently. Uh, but it enables me to get the entire record collection that I bought, every, every single record I bought, every single record my wife bought, every single tape, every bit of stuff that I borrowed off the radio. Most of the things I borrow and keep off the radio are stuff. The BBC engineers are superb and, and really are good. And you get a lot of live performances where artists come in for a studio interview and they all sing a song there, I mean, just them on the guitar or playing their instrument. And it just comes across beautifully. And the BBC archive this, label it, and you never hear it again. So I kind of like to keep some of this. I have a, a great recording, and I think one of my favourites is Robert Plant singing in the, uh, the desert in Mali uh, with um, uh, Tumani Jibati uh, singing Whole Lot of Love. It is to die for. And you just, it's not just not commercially available anywhere. So I think that's the end of what I wanted to say, really. Uh, it's given me a huge amount of enjoyment doing this over the years. If you listen to all my LPs again, um, I hear them a lot more on the iPod. <coughs> I think it's given me a, 
something to do with my brain and I'm very tired and I'm very grateful to be allowed to be part of this project. Any questions? A stunned silence. <coughs> Not a question, I'm just washing detergent. Use a soft clean washcloth or piece of velvet to carefully wipe the LP surfaces. Try not to get the label wet. The detergent will, for, yeah, the detergent will float away all the greasy fingerprints. A gentle scrubbing motion will help. Circular, I would suggest. Um, rinse in lukewarm water until all the detergent is gone. Finally, rinse in distilled water, which dries and leaves no residue behind. Air dry your records before playing. Do not be tempted to play the record wet, as this may damage the LP and possibly your style. There was a fashion for doing this some years ago, and it sounded right okay on the first play, but it also tended to gunge up your stylus because the, the liquid on, on, the, on the surface just released the gun and the stylus, so, and then it transfers the gun to the next record. There are a number of commercially available cleaning fluids and cleaning machines that you may wish to consider. The KAV e Record Cleaner and KAV Cleaning Solution. Disco, anti stack and disc washer. Well, um, I think Cos provided most of that uh, information for me. The nice thing about working on workflows like uh, 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 a sub-project like this is you can get a lot of help and participation through the forum. You, uh, you can ask people to read it and preview it, and people will chip in with lots of good ideas, won't they? And help you tune it. It's a nice thing about the Elastic community.